Laura, for the uh, introduction. This is, it's really great to be uh, here in person. I've been giving virtual talks all throughout since 2020. Um, it's really nice to be giving an academic talk again. I've been giving a lot of, you know, uh, when you move from academia to starting your own company, doing a lot of the same technical stuff, there's a lot of things that change in, ter in terms of uh, the things that you do on a day-to-day -day basis, one of the things, uh, the types of talks that you give. So this is refreshing. <laughs> Um, so I'm here to talk to you a little bit about, mostly, about um, the work that I did during my PhD and my postdocs and how that all culminated um, in the company that we now have, StarSpec Technologies, mostly in this idea of new space, and in particular how new space can be utilized for astronomical opportunities, both in the suborbital world and also for um, certain classes of satellite missions that um, I'll get into uh, talking about during this talk. So just to give you an overview, um, we're gonna, I'm going to start with a little bit of an intro to what, how we define new space um, from sort of the more familiar rocket-based you know, approach to space and a little bit more uh, less familiar uh, scientific ballooning, um, which is uh, what I had done a lot of my work in my PhD on and that we're now pr providing uh, from a commercial perspective for, um, uh, on the ballooning side of things. Um, I want to summarize that as sort of our new space approach and go into some of the... Uh, projects that we've worked on in the past and some of the capabilities that we've developed to, to, to this end on the science end as well as the uh, uh, engineering side. So I want to have kind of a mix of instrumentation in science. Um, I want to talk about three missions in particular um, from a technology development perspective, uh, capabilities, that's sort of my world where um, um, you know there's this grand science mission and all of the technical requirements that need to be met to uh, achieve those science requirements. And, um, but then also link that back up to the dedicated science use cases and some of the success stories that we've had doing dedicated science from the new space you know, mentality, either from a balloon or from a rocket. Um, I want to tie that all back together, um, kind of give you a little bit of a spiel about how we see space changing and how space is becoming more accessible for um, scientists and for new technology developers, basically the next generation in developing um, you know, next generation instruments or developing new technologies. Um, and how we think, or we, you know, have started to uh, feel that StarSpec fits into that picture. Um, and then we'll open up for questions, and I'm looking forward to chatting with you afterward um, on some or all of these topics. So to start, just a bit of a primer, new space. What is new space? Um, I'll start with the familiar side. So, um, Everybody knows what a rocket is, or I hope everyone knows what a rocket is. Basically, the difference between new space and traditional space is the cadence and the cost um, in this day and age for getting something into space. Um, you know, I, I don't have to go into detail about how a launch works. You know, you go on a rocket, you launch, you deploy, and you have something in orbit that is either doing something for terrestrial work, um, you know, a ground-based, uh, a ground-observing mission, or something astronomical-based. Um, uh, pretty simple stuff. Um, the engineering that goes into making this work because of how expensive launches used to be um, was very extensive, right? The cost of the mission is typically dominated by the cost of launch. And what I want to talk about today is how the lowering of this launch cost is making space of this kind, low Earth orbit in particular, more accessible to, um, to the astronomical community and to the next generation. So this is a quick overview just to show you, you know, people are familiar with SpaceX. There's SpaceX there and Blue Origin is kind of, you know, um, all in the media about how um, they're launching rockets and so on and so forth. But it's a really big ecosystem. There are uh, companies and private groups all over the world that are really, you know, driving competition in making the cost for launch um, quite a bit cheaper. Uh, you know, a fact that we like to, uh, that we like to advertise is, you know, a launch that used to cost, um, a launch now is something like a, an order of magnitude lower than it was 10 years ago, and it's always decreasing, trying to really make it easier for folks to get things into space. And uh, this is from 2020. This list is, you know, there, there are several pages of this now, um, uh, just two years later. So that's, that's new space from a, an orbital perspective. Um, I want to spend a little bit more time talking about space from a balloon-borne perspective, because that's something a little bit less familiar. This is a picture, uh, Laura will recognize this, of the BLAST TNG payload in Antarctica right before launch. Um, here's the balloon, and your sense of scale isn't, you can't really tell a sense of scale here, but this balloon is um, about the size of a small apartment building on the ground. Um, when you hear in the news about NASA launching, you know, a football stadium-sized balloon, um, launching a car-sized payload that will unlock the secrets of the universe, like this is, this is it. Um, these are not little hand launches. These are 
uh, 33 million cubic feet balloons. Um, in fact, most of it is uninflated, uninflated here. When it gets to the stratosphere, it reaches the size and volume of a football stadium. Um, this, uh, the unique thing about a balloon is unlike a satellite, um, you can actually put a parachute on it, pop the balloon, and, and bring it back down. Uh, you know, dust it off, refurbish it, and launch it again. Um, the one project that I worked on, Superbit, we actually launched uh, four years in a row. Launched, refurbished, put new equipment on, launched it again, refurbished, put new equipment on, launched it again. Um, and that's one of the unique things about ballooning is that you can actually have sort of a more closed loop design cycle, improve things, learn from your previous launches, and, and make improvements there. So this flight train, um, another thing that's different about that, uh, about a balloon-based mission compared to a space-based mission is, you know, you're still in a gravitational environment. You're basically hanging like a big pendulum from this balloon and designing control systems and designing uh, gimbaled systems that can still do, you know, high precision science and give you the fidelity that you need on the science end is, um, is a challenge. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, as we get into the specific projects. Um, so, you know, there's a parachute. Um, and uh, I was talking about this over lunch, but one of the uh, one of the major events that happens at the end of a balloon-borne mission is shoot shock. Um, these balloons go up to about 40 kilometers, so you're in the stratosphere, so the air is very thin. Um, and when the balloon pops, um, you eventually hit um, the stratosphere or the troposphere, which is a much denser layer of the atmosphere. And the chute literally shocks. You get a 10 to 15 g shock um, suddenly. Um, it's not a gradual transition. You're moving quite fast because you're eventually you're basically at free fall through the stratosphere. And designing for an instrument that weighs, uh, I think, blast was something like 8,000 pounds on, on the pin, so right at the connection to the parachute, something that can you know, be suitable for recovery, it doesn't come down in pieces, is, is also an interesting engineering challenge. Um, that's why I talk about this component here, what we call the pivot or the rotator. Um, the pivot is the main mechanical component that connects the payload to the balloon and has to mitigate this 10 to 15 g launch shock. Um, an interesting thing here for those that are familiar with spacecraft is we can use this pivot in very much the same way that you would use like a magnet torquer or a thruster. You can actually dump the momentum away from this, uh, from this payload. Um, there are reaction wheels that uh, build momentum on constant disturbances. And you can actually dump momentum up towards the balloon and sort of uh, preserve um, your, your pointing stability um, in that way. Um, so the payload, like I said, you know, 3,600 kilograms or 8,000 pounds. This is kind of the upper limit for the size of payloads that we launch. We launch everything from, you know, 1,000 kilograms, which is considered small, up to big, giant payloads like Blast, um, with very large uh, design envelopes, eight by four by four, two kilowatts of power. This is not a CubeSat. This is a <laughs> this is a, a big machine, a big observatory. And the sort of flights that you get, again. Um, the, the dream is you, uh, you bring it down, you refurbish it and launch it again. You can get anywhere from 20 to 50 days uh, from a, a place like Antarctica. Um, and if you're launching from mid-latitude, you can actually get upwards of 100 days um, at mid-latitude um, doing mid-latitude science. Uh, so here's a bit of a close-up. Close here's the same payload. Um, just to give you a sense of scale, you know, that's a person. This is a big truck. And this is really, you know, a, a massive experiment. Um, this is another picture from earlier um, in 2015, just uh, just to show, like you know, we're we're well above the atmosphere, we're above 99.2 percent of the atmosphere. Uh, the theoretical seeing limit from 40 kilometers is 10 milliarc seconds. Um, the pressure is something like three millibar. So you're really in a space-like environment, but a lot cheaper than it would be traditionally to get that space environment from from a space-based telescope or an, an equivalent space-based telescope with the same capability. Um, I mentioned this before, but refurbishment is a big thing. This is this, these are the four years in a row. Uh, we actually skipped a year. We skipped 2017 because of uh, logistical issues. But um, we launched the same payload almost four years in a row, every single year, all within the course of my PhD, actually. <laughs> um, so it was a very exciting, stressful time to, um, have <laughs> to have a payload where, you know, on the face of it, as a you know, new grad student saying, it would be great if I could launch it once, launching it, you know, four times within that within the course of a, a PhD. I guess this was technically after my PhD, but um, is it's something that's unique to ballooning. You can't really do that with a satellite. And this is one of our sample, you know, glamour shots of uh, NGC 7335 that we took from Superbit. Um, no special filtering is done here. This is just a straight stack of um, multiband imaging from uh, from about 300 nanometers to 1,000 nanometers. Um, and yeah, you know, recoverable, refurbishable on short timescales. Um, you can have high, high latitude flights or mid latitude flights. 
Um, it's a very different thing from, um, from a satellite, but I want to tie that all up with um, why we think these two go together. And it's the idea that, you know, the getting to space, um, the answer had been, you know, you can get to near space with a balloon a lot cheap, a lot more cheaply than you would with a rocket. But this gap is, is really shrinking. And, you know, I, I was just reading an article yesterday that the cost for a launch for something like this is almost the same as the total cost for a launch on a balloon, um, equivalently for, for a rocket. So you have to question, you know, why are we even launching balloons? Why can't we do technology development? Why can't we do, um, you know, high risk, high reward science on, on a rocket based rideshare compared to, compared to a balloon? So, you know, this idea of high risk, high reward, this idea of um, lowering the barrier to entry to space, um, both from a suborbital perspective and from an orbital perspective, is what we're calling new space. And I'll be talking mostly about balloon born platforms. But I want to wrap that all up at the end of the presentation with how we're transitioning this to, to, to this. So possibilities and opportunities. Um, here's maybe the more interesting part of the talk, um, where I'll go through some of the missions that I've been a part of uh, personally and talk about the, uh, the different engineering capabilities, technology development, and how that enabled um, science um, of various flavors um, you know, across the spectrum from an astronomical perspective. So the first is, um, oh, I guess I can't, can I? Hmm. Guess I have to go over here to do that. Yeah, okay, it's just a quick little video. Um, this is uh, a payload that we're currently developing at StarSpec um, that'll be launched from Antarctica in a couple of years. Um, and this is sort of our bread and butter, it's something that we had demonstrated from the stratosphere that had not been thought to be possible. And this is sub arc second stability for diffraction limited optics in the stratosphere. So what does that mean? That means that we can get up, like as the payload is pendulating and subject to the winds, so to speak, from um, the stratosphere, designing a system that can maintain stability on the order of you know, 30 to 60 to 90 minutes at the sub arc second <coughs> level um, is for these wide field persistent imagers um, is something that had not been done before. And in 2015, we did it, we basically did it for the first time. Um, there are some papers that are, that are out that show some of the results from our various flights. This is the most recent result from our 2019 flight showing that this is um, indeed uh, giving us three axis stability. Superbit is a wide field image, so um, we actually stabilize in all three axes, not just our pointing vector, but also our, our field rotation as well. We stabilize to sub arc second. Oh, there we go. And uh, we do, we go a step further. We actually have a fairly, uh, you know, conservative tip tilt stabilizer at the back end of our half meter telescope that reduces that, you know, 0.5 arc seconds on the telescope down to 50 milli arc seconds on the uh, focal plane. And this is just some of the images from the same paper showing um, the point spread, or not the point spread function, but the centroid distribution function. As we're looking at our target star, how that centroid moves around in our field as it's being actively stabilized. And um, this is something that um, has ge generated a lot of interest, a lot of the reason why we launched not just once, but four times during um, the course of my PhD, and um, why there are a lot of groups um, at NASA, at CSA, here in Canada that are interested in this kind of capability. Um, so you know, from a technology development point of view, we made massive strides showing that you don't have to go to space to get diffraction limited imaging in the near IR to near UV, you can actually do this from a balloon. Um, just a quick overview of uh, sort of the heritage that we're building on. Um, you know, I, I, hadn't, I haven't worked on all of these projects, but you know, our, our technological heritage goes all the way back to uh, Boomerang. And for those that are familiar with Boomerang, Boomerang was one of the first, if not the first, to determine um, or at least put error bars on the geometry of the universe um, from a balloon. And that fed into projects like BLAST, SPIDER, um, SuperBit, and uh, some of the projects that we're working on now, Gigabit and Excite. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And this is just a table showing some of the, uh, how our pointing stability target acquisition has evolved from a technology point of view. Um, and I'll link it to science soon, I'm, I promise. Um, uh, how that has evolved over time and what we think uh, was kind of our first breakthrough in terms of making space a little bit more accessible from a balloon-borne perspective. So what does, <laughs> what does Superbit actually do? Um, I've talked a lot about stability, sub arc second this, and you know, diffraction limited that, but what does Superbit do? Uh, Superbit's dedicated science is weak lensing in galaxy clusters. So um, it has a wide enough field of view that you can actually capture the entire field 
uh, an entire galaxy cluster and do multiband imaging on it so you can get photometry and be able to you know, um, infer uh, you know, weak lensing characteristics from these clusters. The goal is to produce a cluster uh, survey of about 100 to 150 clusters over a 30 or 30 or more day flight in order to put constraints on you know, dark matter distribution in sort of a larger scale. Um, and of course, we have multiband imaging, so we can do um, uh, photometric sensitivity um, in multiple bands. Um, here's you know, a very promotional image we love to compare with the Hubble Space Telescope. Here's the Hubble wide field camera um, of the Eagle Nebula. And here's a picture that we took just for fun in 17 minutes during the 2015 flight, just to give you a sense of the size and the sensitivity and the resolution that this platform um, can, can do from a balloon, no less. Another comparison. <laughs> Uh, again, the Hubble wide field camera here. This is NGC 7335. Um, and this is just showing, this isn't actually a very good picture. Um, we had much higher resolution science pictures, but this was more or less a glamor picture just to show that we can take these, these sorts of images. Again, no special filtering for the, uh, all the astronomers in the group. You'll notice that the, uh, you know, the blending here isn't very good, but this is just to show that the raw data can produce you know, some fairly good results. And one more for, for <laughs> just, just to show it, the Omega Nebula. Um, so, you know, this was our first success story. Superbit flew four times uh, from 2015 to 2019. It is literally on a ship right now, or it's getting packed up to go on a ship right now to fly to, or to sail to Wanak, New Zealand for its final science flight where, where it will accomplish its, its mission of um, generating this uh, catalog of galaxy clusters um, in order to do, to do that kind of science. Um, Superbit was a huge technology uh, demonstration step in itself for big projects like Gigabit, which is a three times larger, a 1.5 meter near, op near UV to near IR telescope, which is, being, which is being proposed as an observatory that will fly annually from Wanaka to do uh, science both on the weak lensing side, but also open to guess ob observation um, across the board that, has, that, that would find use in this sort of instrument. And other projects that StarSpec on its own has, has gone and started helping groups at NASA Goddard develop um, similar technological capabilities for, um, for different missions, not necessarily weak lensing. Um, so now we'll talk about BLAST. This is going to be most familiar to, to Laura. <laughs> um, uh, that uh, this is another example of technology development. BLAST was extremely ambitious. It's one of the largest payloads, I think, that has, has been flown. Um, in fact, the very shape of BLAST is exactly the, uh, if you look at the NASA launch envelope for what is possible or what can fit within their launch envelope, it's exactly the shape. It's almost like the engineer designed it to go right onto the margin there. Um, it's a 2.5 meter uh, carbon fiber mirror. It uh, uses frequency domain multiplex MKIDs as their detectors. Um, a fairly, you know, I've worked with larger cryostats, but this is a fairly large cryostat. Um, I think it's something like 300 liters, um, a 200 millikelvin liquid helium receiver with a half wave plate. And um, it has enough computing power, enough uh, physical power to do some data analysis on board and um, during flight. So here's a picture, here's a schematic of all the different components that make it work um, from a gondola perspective. And here it is as built um, before, before launch. Um, here's another picture, um, that's me at the bottom. Um, I, the, the reason why I show this picture is, um, you know, all of the components that go into making such a large, ambitious project work, things like the high capacity power system, star trackers, reaction wheels, all of the components that um, sometimes are taken for granted from a, per, from a science perspective. You know, the science is focused on the detectors and on the, uh, the cryostat, um, but all of the supporting equipment, um, I think BLAST did a good job of, of um, demonstrating that for uh, you know, probably one of the most ambitious balloon-borne missions, you can demonstrate um, these capabilities and, and support these sorts of capabilities from, from a balloon-borne environment. Um, what's BLAST's science? Well, BLAST TNG's science um, was, or is, uh, magnetic fields and star formation. So looking at how magnetic fields affect the rate and structure of star formation, looking basically at the polarization signal from, from dust. And I'm not an expert in, in this field at all. Um, for an engineer, you know, Translating this into science requirements is, is w or into technical technical requirements is um, sort of my focus. But um, you know the the idea for for blast is to is to have very high fidelity measurements of these 
uh, of these uh, GNCs in order to try to understand um, the role of magnetic fields in, in star formation. Um, so, you know, BLAST is very, very much a success story. Um, in, from a technology perspective, uh, BLAST had a, an unfortunately short flight from Antarctica. That's kind of the, the game in ballooning. It's high risk, high reward. But a lot was gained from that flight. Um, the first demonstration of frequency domain multiplex kids at the scale and sensitivity that was required for this kind of science. Um, you can see here BLAST uh, <laughs> landing in the middle of the Antarctic Plateau. It's not a pretty scene, but 85% of all of the science critical e equipment were recovered and can be reused for, for science. And in fact, you know, in the works right now is the BLAST Observatory, which is being proposed as a facility class instrument for submillimeter instruments at mid-latitudes. Um, and there, you can find online at, on the Northwestern website some of the, uh, some of the uh, sensitivity results from, from, this, uh, from this mission. So another mission uh, from, uh, that is very closely related to BLAST, more so than Superbit, is the SPIDER mission. Uh, SPIDER is a cosmic microwave background experiment um, looking at the anisotro anisotropies and polarization and foregrounds for um, the CMB. Um, we thought the BLAST cryostat was big, the SPIDER cryostat is huge. Um, this cryostat is 3,000 pounds. You can see that the gondola structure, the supporting mechanical structure, is as small as it can be to facilitate this massive cryostat. It has six focal planes with sensitivity at 90, 150, and 285 gigahertz. Um, and it flies from Antarctica, high latitudes, um, uh, 75 degree azimuthal scans to be able to probe um, the polarization signal from the CMB. Um, here's the primary science result from the SPIDER collaboration in 2021, um, showing their constraints on the tensor scalar ratio um, from data collected in 2015. Um, this is just a figure, basically the main result, comparing it with Planck. And there's a lot more. I encourage you to, uh, if you haven't looked at this paper, to look at it in detail. It's actually a really good resource for folks in the field um, looking at um, very careful analysis about the systematics and um, improvements to be made from SPIDER going into now what is SPIDER 2. Um, and SPIDER 2 right now is literally on a ship, or it might have arrived already, in Antarctica. Um, and the team has just deployed. I think they deployed yesterday. And they'll be flying SPIDER 2 um, by the end of this year, if not uh, first thing January next year. Um, so SPIDER 2 is coming soon to further constrain uh, you know, uh, CMB foregrounds, as well as put further constraints on the tensor scalar ratio. So this is just kind of, a, I, I wanted to uh, have the, the meat of the talk sort of going through the different capabilities, really give a sense for, uh, from, you know, from Superbit, which is very different from BLAST, which is also different from SPIDER, the different science that you can do. Right now we're working on a bunch of experiments all the way from radio down to x-ray, um, from mostly balloon-borne missions, but also with the idea that these balloon-borne missions will eventually step to space-based missions um, in the future and accelerating that process and making use of um, the, the, you know, basically the future of space access as we see it now um, with the reduced launch cost is what I want to talk about in this next section here. So um, this is the way that StarSpec and a lot of uh, the folks that, that work with our groups think about space. Um, you know, there's a lot of commercial demand um, sort of driving this lower barrier to entry. It's not that, you know, astronomy is also demanding for more access to space, but there are commercial demands mostly from the communication side, but also from the imaging side. There's a lot of demand for um, a lot of high resolution imaging pointing downwards, um, whereas traditionally, you know, a, a lot of our technology is made for, for pointing upwards. But this is sort of driving the demand for lowering that cost, lowering the barrier to entry for space. That's on the one side, that's the demand. On the other side are the constraints. Um, I'm sure everyone's seen pictures of, of something looking like this, showing that orbit around Earth is getting very constrained. Um, just uh, this is a, you know, a, a, an article I, had, I happened to be reading and I wanted to include in this uh, presentation from September um, saying that you know, there is new litigation, new, new regulations being put on making sure that we can, in 10 years, still use space in the way that we use it now. Um, and making sure that missions are designed and hardware is designed in a way that is conscious of um, the increasing constraints on, on LEO and on um, on in space in general around Earth. So we see sort of, you know, a mix of this demand and the constraints. And 
how do you have to think about future space-based missions? You know, ballooning is one thing, but if we want to transition ballooning to a space-based environment, how do we think about how to design missions in a way that operates meeting this demand, but also within these constraints? So this is a very non, not to scale, non-quantitative, very much just to show a point graphic <laughs> of um, uh, risk versus cost per unit for, uh, for a space-based mission. This is the traditional mark. So, you know, uh, you basically throw money at a project for something like JBOS to keep de-risking the technology. There is always an inherent risk for launch. And you, you know, try to de-risk the technology as much as you can with careful engineering, um, you know, a lot of reviews and, and a lot of uh, tests beforehand in order to de-risk it. You sort of asymptotically approach the, the base risk for, for launch, which is just uh, a reality for, for rocket-based launch. And you know, JWST doesn't sit on this dotted line because it had a lot of technology risk associated with it despite all of the money that had been thrown at it. Um, and then if you go look at something like a CubeSat, on the left-hand side, you know, there is a base launch. There had been a traditional um, sort of wall in terms of the cost, where the cost for launch was, was high per mass. And CubeSats can get away with, you know, um, because they're not as expensive an instrument, um, spending less on the actual instrument itself, but there's always this base cost that you can't really push past. Uh, the answer before for us was if you want to access space, put it on a balloon. It's lower cost, quite a bit lower cost, and um, you can accept a higher risk as a result um, because you hadn't invested all of this cost in the gray area. So again, this is just to make a point, but um, the uh, reduced costs basically redefine a curve, which has brought um, you know, the space-based world uh, the gap between balloon-borne platforms and space, even in a high-risk posture, has been brought a lot closer um, to the point where, in even recent news, um, you know, the cost for a launch for something like Superbit is actually about the same as launching something similar from a balloon. So new space is about reduced launch costs that allows for a new risk posture, bridging the gap between suborbital and orbital, and depending on your risk posture, you'll land somewhere on this curve. But the gap is a lot smaller because of this reduced cost for launch. Um, you can start talking about economy of scale. There are a lot of groups uh, in the astrom astronomical community that we're chatting with. Um, there's a group out of Berkeley called Curios, which wants to build a constellation of 100 satellites um, that will do continuous full sky survey in the, uh, in the near IR to do gravitational wave follow-ups, all sorts of stuff. Um, and you know they're, they're looking at launching their first satellite within the next few years. So economy of scale becomes important because now you can take advantage of this reduced launch, launch cost. And how to design the instrumentation knowing that there is less risk involved with, with the launch and less of an investment in that, in that launch cost. So that's where we think we fit. <laughs> um, we've been doing this sort of thing for balloons for a long time, mostly out of necessity. You know, grad students working on a balloon-borne project uh, versus you know, um, sort of larger scale um, commercial applications in the traditional sense, we, we believe that we can take the technology and the sort of know-how and the approach to space um, that we have developed for balloon-borne instrumentation and to use, you know, you know to, to use a word, I guess, bootstrap our way to space. Um, there are differences, of course. There is a technolo technology gap to be, to be, uh, to be um, bridged and, uh, and a cost gap to be bridged, but in a new regime where we have cheaper launches and we can start talking about um, a, sort of a closer and more like a tighter design loop in terms of bridging that technology over. So, you know, we, a lot of the groups we work with are in the astronomy world, but um, we're applying this sort of high risk, high reward approach to space uh, in many other fields, high resolution imaging of the ground, um, looking at critical infrastructure using synthetic aperture radar or interferometric synthetic aperture radar. And we work with groups all the way from, you know, a blank sheet of paper all the way through to operations and everywhere in between. Um, all with this idea of trying to lower that barrier to entry to space um, in order to utilize it better, but also in a way that is conscious of the increasing constraints in space. Um, this is Forgive the the uh, you know uh, company level flowchart thing here, but <laughs> this is sort of uh, we we just submitted a proposal to the CSA. This is from that showing how the technology flows from sort of TRL eight TRL eight or nine in the balloon-borne world. How we're using um, technology programs we that we call tardigrade to effectively bridge the gap from ballooning to TRL six for Leo, 
and then demonstrating that through opportunities with the CSA, through clients that we're working with at the moment, to demonstrate that you know you really can take this approach to space in a low risk, well, you know, an acceptable risk and a low cost way. Um, and these are just some examples of at the component level, various you know attitude control systems, reaction wheel star cameras. Eventually, we want to provide entire platforms that can um, make space accessible in, in a way that hadn't had not been done before. Uh, and I'll go really quickly through this. This is just you know some just an overview of the different types of platforms, borrowing from Superbit. You know, um, highly precise, highly pointed platforms. Uh, you know, scanning platforms like Spider or Blast, technology development platforms. This is more just to highlight where we sort of modularized our thinking in terms of the different kinds of platforms that are available. And flipping that around to space-based platforms, um, telescope modules, you know, Earth observation modules and qualification modules that, um, you know, we're working on uh, bootstrapping for space. Um, you can learn a lot more on our website, but uh, these are some of the projects that we're actively working on now. Um, Excite is the Exoplanet Climate uh, inter, uh, climate Infrared Telescope. Um, they're doing exoplanet spectroscopy from a balloon, basically taking the Superbit platform as is, um, building it again, and putting their own spectrometer on the back with their own special detectors and um, doing exoplanet science from a balloon. Uh, we're working with a group called Picture J. They're actually doing uh, coronography from a balloon. Um, Curios is the group I talked about before where they want to launch a fleet of um, uh, you know, IR sensitive satellites in order to do, you know, continuous sky coverage of the full sky with a constellation of 100 satellites. Um, Taurus is uh, a tau machine that is being flown on a balloon, um, continuing CMB research, but on larger angular scales, uh, all sorts of projects. Um, this is only, uh, you know, just what I could fit on a page. You can probably find a lot more about it on, uh, on our website. But just to give you an idea of how we've started to try to provide value um, in terms of the all the instrumentation that goes into uh, a balloon-based mission or a space-based mission um, in order for um, the science to be, to be executed effectively. And you know, that's why it's great to come and give talks and, and chat with folks because it's really, you know, it's, we're not going to convince you know, folks at, at NASA that have you know, worked on JWST and, and on the Hubble about this you know, uh, transitioning into this new space regime. It's really the, the new generation that are looking to take advantage of um, of the opportunities that are being made available um, through the availability of technology and the availability of launch um, that, uh, that, is, um, that we think is important to us. So, and of course, linking in with uh, industry partners for um, up and coming leaders in, in the space industry is something that we're focusing as well. So these are some of the institutions that we're actively involved with um, and sort of just trying to tighten this loop um, and make this economical and uh, and a lot more attractive to, to the academic community. Um, so that's the end of my talk. I'm going to uh, do questions and just show you a video of one of our launches. Um, this was the first launch that I had been a part of, uh, the uh, BIT telescope. Here we go. Um, this is the way that uh, the Canadian Space Agency and the French Space Agency uh, collaborate and do launches. So they have this tow balloon here. Um, which is basically just providing neutral buoyancy for the payload, while the proper balloon um, ascends and eventually takes over. So you can see a bunch of uh, uh, French Space Agency employees there just kind of hand launching, <laughs> hand launching the balloon, waiting for release of the main balloon. And as tension builds in the main, in the main flight train, they kind of let it go, and it actually rips this balloon in half. The, the parachute actually lives inside this balloon, and away it goes. Um, there it goes. Yeah, so it's hard to see because it's night, but um, there, yeah, it's really hard to see. But uh, the balloon actually straightens out, and um, we put a couple of GoPros because why not? Um, and uh, we were able to get, in just a second here, um, a couple of... This was not the interesting part from a science perspective because it was daytime. We do most of our observation from night, but um, of course, nice shots like this where you know <laughs> you see sort of the atmosphere and the curvature of the Earth, um, and then you pop the balloon and it comes down, and here it is landing in the forest. Uh, in a second, there we go. Yep, <laughs> yep, it landed on its side <laughs> in the rain, um, and it. Uh, landed waiting for the recovery folks. There they are. 
to come by and um, unfortunately they unplugged the GoPro. They thought it was a hard, a hard drive. Um, we would have gotten more footage for the way, uh, on the way back. But uh, yeah, just to give you an idea of uh, what a balloon walk looks for. So anyways, thank you very much. Um, I'll take questions now. Thank you so much, Heather, for this presentation. And